yep, thank you, Ben. Um, so good evening, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Jonathan Haskell, who has come back to Bristol tonight. Uh, Jonathan, and I, Jonathan and I have known each other for over 20 years, and we have many things in common. We both graduated uh, from the University of Bristol for our first degrees. We both spent far too much of the late 90s working at the Office for National Statistics, setting up and analysing a rather difficult data set to look at UK productivity. We're both economics professors and Jonathan is currently a professor at Imperial College. Our daughters both have the same name. We both have graying hair and glasses, but as you can tell, I'm rather uh, clutching at straws now for similarities. Um, and perhaps that's where they end. So over the last few years, Jonathan has taken on a number of high profile public service roles within economics. He's been a panel member on the UK Competition Commission, now the Competition and Markets Authority. He's been a non-executive director of the UK Statistics Authority. And obviously he's currently a member of the Bank of England Monetary Policy Committee. He's also undertaken a substantial amount of research on both the measurement and the role of intangible assets in understanding productivity. And he's written a book on this, Capitalism Without Capital. And as a result of all of these achievements, Jonathan has also been awarded a CBE. So I think that pretty much sums up uh, Jonathan and the things he'll be talking about tonight. So what I'll do now is hand over to Ben Pimley, who is a third year student in economics, who's going to be our host for this evening's um, talk. Thank you, Ben. Thank you very much, Helen, for that great introduction. And once again, thank you very much for joining us tonight, Jonathan. It's great to have you with us. Thank you very much, Ben. Thank you, Helen, for that very kind introduction. That's very thoughtful, thank you. So in terms of the format for the event tonight, I'm just going to ask Jonathan a couple of questions about his background to start off with. And then Jonathan's going to launch into an interactive presentation about productivity and all things related to that and the production function. Uh, we then should have lots of time for audience questions. So throughout the talk, if you can start thinking of questions, you want to pop into the Zoom chat and then Jonathan will get to those in the later stages of the talk tonight. So as Helen alluded to, Jonathan, you started your career in economics essentially at Bristol. So can you talk a little bit about your background at Bristol and what you enjoyed so much about it? Thanks very much, Ben. That's very kind. And thanks to everybody for joining tonight. Um, it's a pleasure to be back at Bristol. I wish I was only with you in person, but uh, when all this is over, um, I'd look forward to coming down and meeting you all personally. Yeah, I had a terrific time. Uh, Ben at Bristol, I, I was treated with great kindness um, by a couple of uh, tutors in particular. Uh, they're long since retired, but if you'll forgive me, uh, I'd like to shout out for Alan Armstrong and Malcolm Clark, um, who were wonderful to me, um, very thoughtful and, uh, uh, um, you know, providing me with lots of inspiration and so on. Uh, and then I just had a series of terrific teachers uh, at Bristol and just did lots of interesting things in economics, essentially driven by the good quality of the teaching uh, and very targeted types of teaching at what the current problems in the world um, were. So I remember doing terrific courses on unemployment, which was very high at the time. Um, though green issues and so forth, environmental economics kind of wasn't an issue at all back then. We kind of didn't understand, you know, global warming and all that sort of stuff. Um, but issues like unemployment and uh, macroeconomics um, were very high up on the agenda. And I got some terrific teaching. So um, I had a lovely experience um, at Bristol, as I say, uh, uh, with some um, marvelous tutors um, who are terrific towards me. You've talked about in the past, uh, the study of economics can perhaps be summarised by asking a very good question, is there a better alternative? Can you talk a bit, a bit more about what you mean by that phrase and why it's so important within the study? Of yeah, if you think about a lot of public policy questions, whenever you listen to the radio or you know watch the TV, you've always got people coming up with terrific ideas of what to do and what not to do and, uh, uh, and so on. And so economists, I think, um, ask a very good question, which is, well, if you don't like the current situation, um, how is it relative to the alternative? And why that's a rather valuable question is because of the various theorems of welfare economics. So sorry to you know mention some technicalities at sort of six o'clock in the evening. Because of the theorems of, of welfare economics, we know as economists what a benchmark or good alternative looks like. Right. As long as markets are complete and all the various things that we learn about in the classroom, we know that that's a sort of a, a good in some sort of sense situation. 
And so uh, we're able, I think, as economists to diagnose a lot of suggestions that people make for making the world a better place uh, because we know what the yardstick is. Uh, uh, we've got some sort of measure, no matter, even though it's rather abstract, we've got some sort of measure which tells us what, what as I say, a kind of a good allocation uh, would be uh, and how to get there. Um, and I think that's just a very helpful way then of understanding a lot of the questions and a lot of the policy issues and a lot of the suggestions uh, that you hear about, you know, discussed in the real world. So your interest in research, particularly focused on productivity and innovation, as Helen mentioned, is, was any of that sparked by your time at Bristol or was there anything specific that led you down those routes within economics? Uh, yeah, a cu couple of things. I, I was quite inspired. Um, I did an economic history course uh, and the economic history course sort of stressed productivity and growth all the time. Uh, and once you start thinking about that uh, and you think to how very um, unwell off, you know, our grandparents were, you know, um, maybe our great grandparents. Um, so my you know, if you think about our great grandparents, they probably didn't have penicillin. Um, certainly, you know, no central heating, air conditioning, electricity was a new thing, no planes, you know, and think how much better off we were uh, with that. So that, that, that was one set of issues which kind of caught my attention. The other issues that caught my attention, um, I remember very well a particular lecture um, by someone in the what was then the economic history department, I think it was a historian actually in the economic history department, um, who spent the whole lecture talking about barbed wire. Uh, and I'd never thought that barbed wire would be either interesting or important, but it turned out to be a massively important innovation because before there was barbed wire on the American plains, cattle would just roam around. And so if you were a homesteader attempting to grow something, cattle would just trample all over your, um, all over your fields. Uh, and there was a, just a war between the homesteaders, quasi war between the homesteaders uh, who would, you know, who would starve to death if their, uh, if their uh, crops were ruined uh, and the cattle owners. Um, and, and of course there weren't, there weren't enough trees around because, you know, the huge American prairies to build fences and along came barbed wire. It was a, you know, a, a, an epoch making invention which allowed the putting up of those fences uh, and changed therefore property rights and started uh, developing markets and all that sort of stuff. So um, I remember, as I say, uh, at, at, that was a time in my second year uh, at Bristol, um, which, uh, uh, you know, caught my inspiration very much and has been, you know, inspiring ever since, since I remember that lecture even now. Yeah, I think certainly for me as well, learning about things like the Malthusian trap, it just you know, like you say, you cannot take for granted how much progress we've had. Maybe Robert Gordon's rise of the American growth in a century to 1980, that's a really eye-opening look at how far we've progressed in such a short period of time. So I think without much further ado, I think it's probably time to get into your presentation. And so I'll leave you to it. Uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Ben. So, um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, you know, again, thanks for joining us. Uh, as Ben has just said, and I've just explained, I'm very interested in productivity. So let me say a few words about productivity. Let me see if I can advance the slides. If I do, if I do this, hopefully that will advance the slides. That advance, can somebody give me a thumbs up? So that's advanced. That's brilliant. All right. So, so certainly when I was at Bristol and I learned about the production function, I learned about productivity. Uh, the first thing that was written down on the blackboard or on the whiteboard uh, or the screen uh, was a production function. And there's a production function, which I'm sure everybody on the call has met, uh, output in terms of uh, capital and labor and this rather mysterious thing called A, which is powers output in some way, or in terms of productivity, which is output per unit of labor, uh, capital and labor and so on. And I've got some quotes here from Paul Krugman, uh, the Nobel Pri economics Nobel Prize winner, as well as doing a lot of very abstract uh, economic uh, theory. Um, he's sort of popularized economics and he's got a tremendous way of, of homing in on exactly what the important issue is so here's some quotes here productivity isn't everything but in the long run it's almost everything on a country's ability to raise its standard of living depends upon raising output per worker so what I thought I'd just say something about is how do we get from this rather abstract equation which as I say hopefully everybody has met before how do we get that to understanding this statement uh, if we've got something which is incredibly important, you know, more or less everything, uh, but we represent it as a production function, let's make sure that we understand the production function. All right, so in order to do that, uh, let's uh, go along uh, in the following way. It's quiz time, right? So um, we're not going to be just sitting around. Um, you have to do, uh, you have to do, do a bit of uh, answer some quiz stuff. 
So there's this fantastic book called The Fabric of Civilization, which Ben and I were talking about uh, earlier on, uh, and it's about genes. Uh, so th those of you um, who wear some jeans, there's a picture of some jeans there. Uh, and uh, we're going to do a quiz now. And the quiz question is, Ben, do you want to put the quiz question up? Um, which is this. Uh, so I'd like everybody to have a vote. Uh, how many miles or kilometers, if you prefer kilometers of cotton thread, are in a pair of jeans? You've got a quarter of a mile, half a mile three quarters of a mile, one mile, six miles. So I see people voting. Don't worry, I'm not monitoring your votes and nor are the Bristol staff monitoring your votes. So um, don't don't worry, just, just have a guess. Just a pair of blue jeans um, like that. Um, good, I see lots of people voting. Go on, last, last few votes, um, please. Go on, five more people are ready to vote. Um, they're obviously putting their genes on uh, as we speak and can't vote. All right, why don't we stop it there? Uh, so, um, and the correct answer is highlighted in red there. And the answer is six miles, the six miles of thread uh, in, in the genes. Um, now, if I then take that off and try and advance the slides, um, what this book um, is about, is it? A, it's about what you have to do over the ages in order to make six miles of thread. Now, six miles is a lot, right? Those of you who live in Stoke Bishop, I think it's more than six miles, I would imagine, to get from Stoke Bishop to the department, probably there and back. So think about six miles. That is a lot of thread in the genes. And as I say, what I recommend about the book is it documents um, how you make all of that. So let's go to all of that. So um, who's this? Uh, I can't see the chat, but somebody can come in on the chat and tell me who this is. Ben, you're gonna have to tell me if you can see the chat, if somebody's got the right answer. Yep, Vibab's, Vibab got it on the chat and uh, Aria as well. There Brilliant, so this is Gandhi, uh, and he is using uh, something called a, a, a charka, uh, which is a portable spinning wheel. Uh, and Gandhi's, uh, one of Gandhi's kind of economic policy, so let's get straight into the economics of all of this, is that he strongly encouraged India, this was in the years when, of course, uh, India was under British colonial rule, uh, to make their own cloth and not import British cloth, which at the time uh, India imported a massive amount of. Um, so right in front of you there, and the photographer there is a very famous photographer called Margaret Bookwhite. Um, you should look at her other photographs if you're at all interested. Um, so, so a question then is, what is the technology involved in spinning thread? Because what that thing does is that spins thread. And as we've just learned, we've got six miles of thread to spin just in order to make some genes. So let's pop on to some uh, data about all of this. Uh, it's quiz time again. And we're gonna start with a quiz, which I'm gonna tell you the answer, um, which asks how long does it take to spin the six miles of cloth, which is, is what the book is about. Okay, so to get started, uh, we'll start with the Bronze Age. Um, and in the Bronze Age, it took 37 days. So your next question is uh, the question one there, uh, which is coming up. So vote for question one. Uh, well, right, there are two questions. So let's do both the questions together. Um, so if you question one says, let's use Gandhi's technology, which is the charka, which is basically pre-industrial revolution uh, and see how long it takes. Uh, and then the question two is how long does it take to spin six miles of cloth in the modern day? All right, so remember it's the six miles, uh, that's the cloth um, that we need to generate a pair of jeans. So excellent, I see lots of good voting going on. Um, seven days is, seems to have the edge for the uh, charka, and then we've got three minutes has got the edge for modern day machines. Um, any more votes coming in? Yep, a few more last people. Go on, click the button if you're if you're ready to vote. A few more last people want to vote. Um, all right, let's close the voting there, Ben. Um, and so, so, so he, here's the here's the answer. Um, let's come up with different colors. Here's the answer uh, for the charka, which is Gandhi's uh, thing. It took 13 days to spin six miles of cloth. Right. So one pair of jeans would have taken somebody full time 13 days to spin all that cloth. So that's an improvement. If you look at the slide, if, the, if you can still see the slide up on the screen from 37 days. So we've already had a bit of a productivity improvement from the Bronze Age, but it's still taken 13 days. If you start then to think about how expensive jeans are going to be, even at what were then very low wages for your average worker in India, um, uh, it, they would still be pretty expensive. How long does it take to spin six miles of cloth in the modern day? Uh, well, 33% of you got it right. The answer is three seconds. 
So a current machine can do it in three seconds time. Now, once you start to think about that, we've gone from 37 days to three seconds. Well, we can then start explaining lots of things. So no wonder the average person earns six, owns six pairs of jeans. It would have been unthinkable not that long ago, actually, um, to own six pairs of jeans. Uh, and it's re reasonable to see why, um, because it just took a, such a long time uh, to make all that thread in the jeans. And, 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 and as, as I say, the book, which I strongly recommend, um, has got lots of terrific examples of all of that. Um, so let, let, me, let me hop on. So let me close this, if that's the right thing. Uh, and uh, so there, there are the questions up on the thing. Uh, and there are some pictures for you. Um, there, there's a modern day um, spinning machine. So let's go back to the production function and ask the question, armed with this example, what do we, how do we say this in sort of production function language? And remember the Y over L and the A and the K over L. So the obvious thing which has happened is that the K has got a lot better. So K is this weird thing called capital. Think of capital as being machines. We've gone from the type of machines, Gandhi's machine up, up on the top right there to these modern day machines on the bottom uh, on the bottom right there as well. Okay, so more capital. So that's gonna account for more productivity and that move from 13 days to three seconds. That's a pretty impressive increase in productivity. I ask the question, what happened to L? You can think of L as being labor input and labor input has done, well, the thing we're doing tonight. It's got more trained. It's got more savvy, it's got more knowledgeable. Um, so that's been an increase uh, in L as well. So you can immediately see that if we're gonna analyze productivity, then what we're gonna try to figure out is we're gonna try to figure out again, going back to the production function, how much of this output uh, per worker per, per unit of L, uh, L being labor, is due to the fact that the K has got a lot better, how much is due to the fact that the L has got a lot better, but then you've got this mysterious thing called A. So the question is, uh, what is A? And so A, um, again, I, I don't know what year everybody's in, but if you've heard the phrase total factor productivity, A is often referred to as total factor productivity um, or TFP. And indeed, um, my uh, tutor, Alan Armstrong, when I was at Bristol, as I mentioned, uh, he did a lot of the early work on total factor productivity. In particular, he was an expert on measuring K. Um, there's a data set even named after him, uh, the Armstrong data set, uh, which was an industrial data set, which measured that K capital for lots of different industries. He counted up essentially all the machines in the textile industry, which is more or less what we've just done. Then he counted up all the machines uh, in the various other industries and so forth. All right, now going back to what this A is, the A is when we talk about TFP, it's the notion that you can get much more out of a bundle of capital and labor. So what does that much more actually mean? So let's go for another example. If I press this button here. So here's an airline example. Uh, those of you who can remember the dim distant days where we used to fly to various places instead of being on the end of a Zoom call might recognize um, those things called airplanes just there. Uh, and there's one of Ryanair's and there's one of British Airways. Uh, and I've picked this because they're the same plane. So this is an example where K is exactly the same. Um, I don't know enough about the crew sizes on aeroplanes, but I'm going to guess that there's probably the, there's the same amount of labor as well. So think of the L on the labor. You've got a couple of pilots and then you've got cabin crew as well. So K and L is the same. Here are some on the slide on the left there. Here are some turnaround times for what Ryanair do. They can get a plane turned around in 25 minutes and British Airways can get a plane turned around in between 50 to 60 minutes. So you can think of the A as being the efficiency with which this capital and labor is being used. And the key to Ryanair is that they can turn this round, this stuff around uh, very, very fast. Um, Helen Simpson very kindly in her introduction mentioned um, that I'd done some work on the Competition Commission. Um, I did a little work on airports in a Competition Commission. And you might ask yourself, how on earth can airports compete with each other? Well, Bristol and Cardiff Airport are uh, Certainly, they used to be in very strong competition to get Ryanair to come and situate at their airport. And what, what did they try to do? They tried to essentially uh, get a better way of turning the, turning the planes around. And then they would go to Ryanair and say, we can turn it around in 40 minutes. We can turn it around in 35 minutes and so on and so forth. So a lot of what they were trying to do was trying to compete uh, by doing a better a. All right, um, a couple more things. Um, so this is a rather busy slide. So I apologize for this busy slide, but this is now going to take us, and I'll just show 
two more slides, I promise. This is going to take us to the answer. On the left hand side, uh, we've got the growth in productivity per hour. That's the thing we want to understand. That's the thing that Krugman says is very important. On the right hand side, we've got the growth in the capital to labor ratio. So those are all those extra machines we just saw, we just saw on all that extra labor. Um, we need to translate that growth into growth in um, output. And we do this by this thing called alpha, which is the output elasticity. So now if you remember your lecture notes, that's given by the share of labor. And then whatever's left over is this total factor productivity. So to, to, to try to bring this to life, if you're trying to figure out the productivity of Ryanair, um, then you, there's more passengers uh, per uh, uh, per pilot and cabin crew, that's the left-hand side, that, that the Ryanair can grow that uh, by having more planes, um, as, as we've just described, but they can also grow it by turning around the planes faster, and that will be the delta A. All right, if we go to the data, let me try and show you some numbers here. Now, all of these numbers are trended, so they're rather difficult uh, to show, but the left-hand side shows the following. This shows the growth in output per worker, um, so this is GDP per worker, uh, and it's broken up into periods after the recession. So the black line is after 1973, the bluish line is after 1979, and the greenish line is after 1990. So keep your eyes on those top three left lines. And what they do is they tell you that starting from 100, starting from post-recession years, productivity growth grew after 73 and grew after 79 and grew after 1990 um, in the way, in the fashion that you see then, it grew at about a, a couple of a percent per year. Uh, the 2007 line is our current situation, right? And indeed the data ends, that's 2019 data because it ends 12 years after 2007. And that's that kind of reddish line at the bottom there. So this is the problem in front of us, which is that for the last 12 years, we've had absolutely terrible productivity growth and that productivity growth just doesn't look like the kind of productivity growth we've had before. I'll show you two more pieces of data. The next piece of data is that graph on the right hand side which says oh well what about the capital uh, per worker. So I mentioned the capital per worker, I mentioned the work of Alan Armstrong uh, and we've carried on that work. Uh, other researchers have carried on that work essentially by counting the amount of capital, counting machines, counting the buildings and so forth. And again what you can see is a bunch of points on the right, uh, which go which go upwards there, which is that in the other periods, capital per worker was growing reasonably reasonably happily, but capital per worker seems not to have grown after 2007. So again, we want to understand that. And finally, 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 and Ben, I'll, I'll show you one more graph, and then I promise I'll stop. Finally, 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 is what's this total factor productivity? What's the, what's the thing that's left over, which is some sense of how efficiently uh, we're doing all of that. So let me show that. So that I'm showing the, those two graphs again. And then in the middle there uh, is total factor productivity. So what's been going on there? Well, the picture is a little bit more tangled, but essentially what you see is the black and the green and the blue line, Those that growth um, before those other pre-2008 um, financial crisis recessions, uh, total factor productivity sort of fell, but then started growing again. But it's been absolutely miserable uh, after 2008. So what's on the table in front of us is trying to understand not only why capital growth has been so miserable, for some reason, Britain has not been investing in those machines that we were looking at earlier on, but also understanding why it is um, that there seems to have been so little growth uh, relative to previous periods uh, in the amount of TFP and the, the efficiency with which um, you use those machines. Now, obviously underneath all of this uh, is a whole load of complicated measurement issues. How do you measure the output in all these various places? The output of a pair of genes is easy to measure because that's the numbers of pairs of genes. And as we've just seen, we can have a stab at measuring the capital. We just saw some pictures of that. Uh, the output of a university or the output of poetry or the output of, uh, I don't know, classic music festival or something like that is a little bit a little bit harder to measure. So there's a whole load of questions underneath all of that. Um, but those are the types of issues uh, which we uh, struggle with uh, all the time. Uh, and the production function gives you a very organized way uh, of thinking about um, all of those kind of questions. Um, ben, sorry, I've been speaking for much too long. So why don't I stop there uh, and I'll, I'll stop sharing the screen uh, and pass back to you. Thanks very much, Ben. That's absolutely brilliant. Thank you, Jonathan, for that. And a great quiz as well. Um, so just there's a couple of questions coming in, in the chat, but I'm just going to jump in first, if I may. Um, so I think this links nicely back to what we were talking about before about economics is about asking, is there a better alternative? Because clearly 
there has been a better alternative in the past for our productivity. Yep. Um, and there's many, many reasons perhaps why we're in this period that some people are calling secular stagnation, perhaps. And I think one of the things that you've talked about in your book, Capitalism Without Capital, is the four S's that might explain perhaps why TFP and other things have lagged since the financial crisis. So perhaps it might be instructive if you could talk through the four S's for the audience tonight. Uh, thanks very much, Ben. Um, and it's very kind of you to mention uh, we do indeed have a book, Capitalism Without Capital. It's coming up to Christmas, ideal Christmas present. If there's that Christmas present you're just searching for ins inspiration, then uh, available uh, at all good Amazons, uh, at, just at the click of a button. Uh, what we do in that book is we try to talk about a different kind of capital in some ways to the kind of capital we've seen. The capital I've, I've tried to show you, the machines and so forth, um, are very much tangible capital. So you can look and feel a machine. Um, we saw the textile machines, we saw the planes, that's very tangible capital as well. But increasingly, what the economy is doing is it's producing intangible capital. That is to say, people are writing software, people are writing Harry Potter scripts, uh, people are doing R&D, people are getting educated and learning new things. And that intangible capital is very different from a machine. It's ideas, it's ways of doing things, it's better business processes, it's better ways of getting people on the plane or better scripts for movies or better Harry Potter scripts or whatever it might be. So with that transition uh, uh, in the type of economy, um, that's got a, a whole series of, of uh, implications around measurement and all that kind of thing. Uh, but in terms of the, um, uh, in terms of the four S's, um, one of the properties of intangible capital is that since it's very knowledge-based capital, it's got some unusual properties as a good. And I'm sure uh, many of you would have studied this, or if you haven't studied this, you'll study it in the future. So for example, uh, it can spill over. That's one of the S's, which is to say, uh, once uh, uh, Apple invent the iPhone, all the other iPhones look the same. That's like a design spillover. Um, it could be scaled up. Once Uber invent an algorithm for getting taxis ordered, then you can use that algorithm all over the place. Um, it's sunk, uh, which is to say that it's often rather difficult for intangible capital to get it back again once you've invested in it. Um, and uh, and, there are, and then the final S is that there are synergies. If I'm Google and I'm really good at search engines, I'm probably going to be very good at other forms uh, of, uh, 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 of search or other forms of software or combining other things together as well. And so those various forces combine together to give us quite a different looking economy to what we had before. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, we've got quite a few questions coming in now on the chat. So I think I'm going to move sure. those now. Um, Asana had the first question. Um, I think I'm going to try and link it to your book nicely. Um, there's a great quote which I really enjoyed, which is um, the fact that in the new monetary policy era, cheap money no longer stimulates investment and consumption. For central banks, it's like a captain heading for a rocky shoal and finding out that your wheel will no longer turn the ship. Uh, and then Asana's question to this point is, do you see interest rates in the Western world over the next decade going back up, staying the same or going negative? Um, in, in, in the whole of the Western world, uh, the whole of the Western world um, is a very good question, actually. Uh, and there's a new book out by Charles Goodhart, which dis discusses this issue. Um, one of the things about global capital markets is the activities of individual central banks are quite heavily restricted by the forces in global capital markets. And the forces in global capital markets are, for example, with an aging population, there's been a tremendous increase in the demand for savings, especially from countries which um, uh, don't have social security nets, uh, such as we do. And that increase in the demand for savings has meant a big increase in the demand for safe assets because people want a safe asset to save from. Uh, and thereby that's driven interest rates on safe assets down, regardless of what it is that central banks can do. So um, whether that trend will continue or not, and the book by Charles Goodhart uh, is, a, is an examination of that, um, is going to be an important determinant um, of interest rates. So that's one set of answers. The other set of answers, just on the intangible side, Ben, since you kindly um, mentioned that, is that banks typically 
find it very easy to lend against tangible assets. So if I'm a company and I have a machine like we saw or a building or a plane, a bank will lend against that as security. But banks find it very difficult to lend against intangible assets. If I go to a bank and say, I've got a brilliant idea for a new book about a wizard, you know, who goes to school in, you know, in, in Hogwarts and this, that and the other, um, the bank probably will hesitate about lending you that kind of money. Um, and that means then uh, that there's a lot more kind of internal financing, which is necessary of these things or financing via people's houses. And that changes the way that the transmission mechanism works from bank funding and from interest rates uh, in, in that kind of economy. So that, that's a kind of a much longer sort of topic, but just to give people a feel for um, where that topic fits in. Yeah. Um, sorry, just the next question, another Jonathan in the chat. Um, hopefully this will be the, maybe the last question on interest rates, but um, mm. he's asking, I guess it's sort of in terms of is the additional capacity, I guess, in monetary policy. He's asking what would likely happen to interest rates in the UK or abroad if another major financial crisis, such as a real estate bubble, were to occur in the next year? Well, the good news is we got lots of smart people at the Bank of England, where I have the honour to work, who are making sure that there won't be another financial crisis. Uh, so uh, we, we are, we're lucky that somebody can study that question hypothetically. Uh, but since it's a hypothetical question, uh, we, we've got our whole regulatory system to make sure we don't go there. Perfect. Uh, this is an interesting question from Luca. Would a four day working week increase productivity? Um, a four day work, or would it increase productivity? Um, great question, Luca. And it goes back to something. Um, well, Hel Helen and I, I remember um, this was a kind of a major question uh, that Helen and I were studying this kind of lump of labor idea, which was often said to be a cure for unemployment which is if there isn't enough work to go around, you could make everybody work less. And then there'd be, if there's a fixed quantum of work, then if you made everybody work less, then you know, more people could sort of squ squish themselves in and that would solve the unemployment problem. And the trouble is there isn't a fixed quantum of work. So it's the same, there isn't a fixed quantum of productivity to go around. Um, so I, I think the way to interpret that question though, is that we have, of course, as everybody knows, had a major, major structural change in the way the economy works. And it's not to do with the fact that we've got zippy new machines in the way that we just saw or new ideas for getting people on planes. It's that we're working from home. In fact, a third of us, a third of the workforce are now working from home. So I think, Ben, if I can take the question in, the, in that direction, um, I, I can't remember who asked the question. Was it Luca who asked, who, asked the question, who asked the question? So I hope you don't mind, Luca, if I take the question um, in this direction. Um, the question is, what's working from home going to do? Is that going to raise productivity or lower productivity? And we don't quite know the answer to that. But what's so interesting about that, uh, well, a couple of things are interesting about that. One thing that's interesting about that is that if you ask firms if they're going to carry on working from home, uh, the answer is that most of them, about 65% of them say, no, actually, we want people to come back to the office. So although there's lots of chat amongst the you know, blogosphere and the Twitter sphere and so forth about all this stuff. The majority of firms want people to come back to the office. So you know, if you're thinking about what to do after Bristol, um, you may well have to go back to the office uh, and stop working from home. Maybe that's good, maybe that's bad, I don't know. Um, that, that's one thing. The second thing is you, you might say, you, we've had this gigantic change where we've got 30% of the workforce working from home. Um, suppose we were an economy dominated by the type of manufacturing processes we just saw on the slides and everybody was at home. Well, they don't have the machines at home. So how on earth can the economy keep going with 30 percent of the workforce at home? Uh, and the answer is because we're in a much more blue uh, white collar uh, uh, um, you, you know, a, a structure of industry, uh, people have got machines at home called computers and they're hooked up via the internet. And so we've successfully, uh, as an economy, managed to navigate, relatively successfully, having 30% of the people work from home without a drop of output of 30%. We've had a drop of output, but it hasn't been 30%. 30 and so um, I think uh, uh, the way to think about it is that what the working from home and the productivity issues highlight is they highlight the question about how effectively we can work on computers and on the internet and so forth and achieve for in some professions at least a relatively seamless experience uh, whether we're at home or whether we're, whether we're at the office yeah i think just sticking with this productivity and working from home idea because it's very current at the moment is mm. pressing another section from your book where you talk about how the death of distance hasn't hasn't not occurred it's just been postponed and perhaps the pandemic is the thing that's 
recatalyze it, I guess, to speed up the death of distance. Um, but you're talking about how when the death of distance occurs or increase in importance, things like social capital will become more important. How would you sort of assess the level of social capital? Yeah, I mean, look, it's tricky, but and everybody on this call will have a view. Um, in some sense, you've all been getting lectures, you know, from Helen and, and you know, fellow staff um, at Bristol, just as I've been uh, teaching my students at Imperial. So we sort of, uh, we sort of, well, we've tried our, our, our best, I should say, to kind of be here for you as it were, but we've, be, we've been here for you as teachers, but down the screen um, and down the wire. And that is in some sense, well, for some people, maybe that's a very, so let me start, let me say, let me step back a minute. For some people, that may be a very good experience. So for example, some of the foreign language students who I teach actually like the experience of going, uh, you know, down the wire. They make a recording, maybe they watch it back at a slow speed. It helps them, you know, if their English isn't quite so good. And, and it's, they find it a good experience, actually. Others find it a very poor experience and not a replacement at all for coming into the lecture theatre and so forth. So, I mean, it's, it's a tricky one. Uh, and everybody on the call will have their, I mean, come, come in on the chat uh, if people have different views as to whether they prefer it or not. Um, I, I, I think for me, the feeling of not having anybody else around and other people to talk to is a major drawback as far as I'm concerned. But like I say, I, th I think it's fine um, if people have different views and different strengths and weaknesses on this. Yeah, certainly some heterogeneous preferences going on. Sure. <laughs> um, switching tack slightly here, uh, I've got a question here which is asking, uh, we're probably going to rephrase it. Already. The question is, how scared is the Bank of England of cryptocurrencies? But perhaps we talk about What's the Bank of England's thoughts about central bank digital currencies or something like that? Um, so the bank's looking at central bank um, digital currency. I don't think the bank's scared of central bank digital currency at all. Uh, I would be terrified of uh, a digital currency that was not issued by a central bank because presumably a digital currency is issued by, well, who is it issued by? Um, nobody who I know. Is it issued by someone who's accountable? Is it issued by someone who I can hop onto the internet and see what the committee who are backing it or can I listen to that committee and get them before parliament and say what kind of job are you doing and all that kind of thing. So um, I don't think we're, we, we, when I say we, if I put my Bank of England hat on, I don't think we're terrified by it. Um, but I think, I think quite the opposite, uh, that uh, if there's any if there's any terror out there, um, it should be uh, the, the, the people who are issuing them in some way, which is unfathomable, unfathomable to people. Yeah, um, interesting question here from Will Meakin, because uh, we had Stephanie Kelton on this series last week. So he's mm. asking, how does the Bank of England view modern monetary theory? Um, I think we're tr open to it and we're trying to, under trying to understand it in a way. Uh, often, um, and, and, and everybody on the call, you know, who's a student would understand this. It's very difficult often to cast modern monetary theory in terms of a model. So it's actually quite difficult to have a conversation with the MNT people and say, ah, oh, are you assuming this? Are you assuming that? What if we did this? And what if we did that? And I know um, that often when you study economics, you think to yourself, oh my gosh, do I have to do yet another model? You know, this is, this is killing me. I've, got, I've already learned three models and now I've got to learn some other model. But in a sense, the discussion around MMT is made more difficult by the fact that without a model, it's rather difficult to sit down and say, well, here are the things we agree on. Now let's go out and find some data and, and try and get a hold of this and so on. Um, all that said, uh, I'm sure the bank, uh, all central banks, um, you know, could could benefit from engaging with the MMT people, uh, explaining what they do better, um, and you know, sort of explaining to people in general um, about how their models work and how they sort of think about things and so forth. Um, and we're trying to do that uh, very hard at the bank, uh, and lots of people at Bristol, I should say, are trying to do that as well, uh, like Ramesh uh, Vatilingam, um, who I'm sure is known to lots of people on this call. Um, and and so that's how I would. That's how, how I would view that uh, relationship with MMT, uh, an opportunity to have you know, good dialogue uh, and, and learn from what they have to say. And hopefully they can learn from what we have to say. Yeah, um, I think this go back now to your productivity presentation. We've got a question mm. from a fellow alumni who's asking, to what degree is TFP growth inhibited by a commutative macroeconomic policy by central banks in the last 20 years? 
inhibiting asset price adjustment and growth in unemployment over the business cycle? Um, good question. Let me expand on the question a little bit. I mean, the accusation le leveled at central banks is that because central banks have been very supportive uh, of the economy, I mean, they, in my opinion, they've had to be, then the sort of process of creative destruction has maybe, maybe been held up, which is to say a very accommodative monetary policy means firms go on for longer than they would otherwise do. They don't exit the market. The bad firms maybe stay around for longer. The good firms maybe don't come in uh, quite as often. Um, and, and that's an accusation which just say been leveled at central banks. The, the trouble is there just doesn't seem to be any data which supports all of that, actually. If anything, it's not the kind of the sort of um, entry and exit process uh, which is boosting productivity growth. It's it, it, that tap has not been turned off. Actually, it, quite the opposite. What seems to have happened is that within firms, the surviving firms, their productivity growth seems to be particularly miserable. Uh, now, there may be some story about accommodative monetary policy there, um, but you'd have to tell a much more complicated story uh, than one uh, where. As I say, which is most people's intuitive idea uh, that somehow or other that tap has been turned off. That just doesn't seem to be the case. Yeah, um, thank you so far, everyone, guys, for your great questions. Uh, I've got another one from Tim here, but if you do have any more for Jonathan, I'm sure I'd be happy for you to keep popping those in the chat. Um, Tim is asking, does the prospect of mainstream digital work support uh, boost productivity for deprived parts of the UK through reducing geographic frictions in the labour market? It's a, it's a great question, uh, Tim, and let, let me make sure I understand the question right. It, th this is the notion that if we did do a lot more move to working from home, then potentially we could just get a whole series of better matches in the workplace. There's, there's no particular reason, if I understand the question correctly, to suppose that... Um, just people in London who can compute, who can commute to London or just people in Bristol who can commute to Bristol, there might be perfectly good workers out there who can do it all on the phone who are in the middle of Scotland or the Isle of Man or the Outer Hebrides or, or whatever it might be. Um, so I think that's a great question to which I'm afraid we don't know the answer, um, probably because we haven't experimented uh, in the way that we've experimented now uh, with that answer. So I will fall back on um, one thing, which is I mentioned earlier on, Ben, that if you go and actually ask firms about their working from home, um, you get some pretty interesting answers and firms don't intend to do this. So one of the other things that, uh, that, that, that you find from these questionnaires, and I should say, by the way, this is the Office of National Statistics who are doing these questionnaires, excellent people to work for. Lots of economists go and work for the ONS uh, over there um, in Newport, terrific set of projects which they do. They run this survey called the Business um, Impact of Coronavirus Survey, and they ask people um, uh, who are intending to have more, uh, firms, sorry, who are intending to have more work from home, why are you intending to have more work from home? And actually rather few of them say it's because we think we're going to get an improved uh, labour pool, as Tim's question uh, was, I think, trying to suggest. In fact, very few of them say that. Mostly they say lower overheads, and you know, less cost of buildings, um, which is a very good, honest economics and accounting kind of answer, uh, but not quite as romantic as an, uh, an answer as in Tim's question. So um, the potential might well be there, but at least at the moment, uh, firms don't seem to think that it'll be of great benefit. Yeah, um, I think this question from Sabri here, which I think relates to sort of more unconventional monetary policy perhaps. Have you found any evidence that bank lending to non-financial firms improves productivity more than lending to financial firms? Um, wow, what a good question, Sabri. Thank you for that. Um, one, if we went back to all of those graphs, which I promise I won't, uh, and did them all for different industries, one of the industries that you'll find has not done very well in the productivity stakes uh, is the finance industry. Um, now, if you ask the question, well, what does the finance industry do? The finance industry does uh, some not very useful things, but it does some lots of useful things. It helps change our money, keep our money secure and all that kind of thing. And if you ask the question, uh, what does the, what kind of capital does the finance industry uh, invest in? Obviously, it doesn't invest in the types of um, machines that we saw up on the slides, but it writes software, for example, so you can do your banking on the phone. So it's a very intangible asset uh, and it builds buildings to, you know, keep your money safe and all that kind of thing, rather more, more, more sort of tangible asset. So I don't see a reason for why uh, to say, oh, well, let's not lend um 
to um, all of those financial firms because, you know, that they're not doing anything. Um, I see a good reason to regulate those firms uh, so to make sure on the uh, liability side uh, that they're doing wise things with our deposits. Um, but I don't see a reason uh, why lending to them um, would be uh, less productive uh, than would otherwise be the case. Yep, and then another question from Jonathan, um, who's asking perhaps slightly pessimistically, is it possible that productivity growth has stagnated due to reaching or approaching a maximum? Yeah, thanks, Jonathan. Uh, you, you Obviously, you've been a, a Bob Gordon reader. You mentioned Bob Gordon's um, uh, excellent book. For those of you who haven't looked at the book, what, what, what you'll know is that uh, Bob Gordon's thesis is that productivity growth can essentially be summarized by the following phrase, one big wave, which is it went up in the Industrial Revolution. Uh, it then stayed high when we invented electricity and we invented aircraft and transport and ICT. But basically, since then, it's all been over. Um, summarized by this um, terrific statement um, uh, by um, the, guy, the guy at eBay, whose name escapes me for the moment, uh, um, who's, who said when the ICT revolution started, you promised us flying cars and all we got was 140 characters on Twitter. Uh, so, you know, maybe all this ICT stuff is all just frippery uh, and there isn't much to come. I'm, um, I'm much more optimistic than that, actually, uh, partly because it takes a while uh, for, these, um, uh, for these new inventions to come and partly because... Uh, what I think it, there is lots of potential for is for the ICT revolution and other parts of productivity re revolution to meet, to, 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 um, to uh, disseminate um, amongst um, uh, um, more, you know, kind of hard uh, to, um, uh, amongst the industries where that product, those productivity and those new techniques has not yet disseminated very much. So for example, I'm thinking about health, um, thinking about you know education let's say um, lots of opportunities in healthcare to use um, the ICT to use things more efficiently um, to have more process engineering uh, to help have a be help have a be better healthcare um, and so I'm optimistic um, about the future if we can get the ICT revolution to reach those parts uh, which it hasn't reached already. Yeah I think I might be Peter Thiel is it? Who would, who would... Peter Thiel yes exactly thank you thank you for reminding me yep. Yeah. I think maybe Jonathan also might be really good. Volrath, because I think he's written a book about how a stagnant economy is a sign of success. But yeah, I think I'm with you on the optimism side. <laughs> yeah, so Vol I recommend Volrath's book as well, actually. So certainly if you're interested on the growth accounting side, he explains incredibly, incredibly clearly. It's just the clearest exposition. And I should say in our book, we tried to explain growth accounting. He does a much better job than us. Um, it's a really clear exposition of the growth accounting. He goes through the data and his basic story there, um, just if people are interested, is that with a large increase uh, in secondary education, uh, in the sort of 40s and 50s, we sort of got to the end of the road as a society about educating more people. We, 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 um, what, what helped us uh, was a great increase in secondary education, but that's now come to the end because we're, we're, we're essentially educating everybody up to a secondary level now. Yeah, I think perhaps actually linking to that theme of coming up to a limit and maybe a new way forward, Sam has asked, do you think there needs to be a fundamental change to the school curriculum? Mm. More focus on technical skills like coding and soft skills like communication and teamwork, which I think is something you touch on in terms of intangibles. Yeah, yeah thanks, Sam. Um, so, so, so let me say where I stand on this, which is um, I, I talked about our work on intangibles and software and design and, and, and things like that. And you might say, oh, is your career's advice to go and become the world's best soft software programmer or become you know the world's best i don't know engineer able to invent some complicated algorithm which you know some firm is going to use to you know have better taxi services or something like that so maybe we should stop all of this poetry and history and maybe we should even stop all this economics business uh, and just have have everybody uh, do coding and engineering and all that kind of thing um, to which my answer is no 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 and it, the reason it's no 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 is uh, Sam, your question nicely alludes to, which is as well as being a good coder and a good engineer and a good algorithm inventor and all that kind of thing, um, what the more intangible economy needs is it needs people who can manage uh, and those uh, gr disparate groups of people, uh, you form synergies between those ideas and bring those ideas to the marketplace. 
those types of people who can do that kind of activity might be the best engineer and they might be the world's best coder and all of that but equally they might be people they, they might be people people if you sort of if you sort of mean um and they might be poets and historians and uh, dare i say economists uh, and so forth as well so um i'm definitely not of the view that we should abandon everything and only study kind of what, it, what are called hard technical things. Uh, I think quite the opposite. There's plenty of opportunity and plenty of scope uh, for all of those soft skills, which um, I think was mentioned in the question. Yeah, um, there's a, quite a micro prudential question from Hisham here. It says, do you think the UK should deregulate small community banks who are the primary lenders to small firms to boost productivity? Um, Hisham, good question. Um, I'm Paul Drula. I'm not involved on the bank uh, bank regulation side, so I can't speak with much authority. Um, they have been deregulated to a certain extent in the sense that if you are a smaller bank, there is a much much I shouldn't say much. There is a reduced sort of regulatory burden on you. Um, uh, you've still got to be well run. We sort of make, you know, make sure that uh, you're not going to steal everybody's money and all that kind of stuff. Um, but relative to the large systematic banks, uh, where the regulatory burden is much more exacting, there's much less of a regulatory burden on you. So I think there, um, that sort of, that has been done. Um, maybe there's scope to deregulate further. I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not an expert on that. But I think that's kind of been, I think that's kind of been done at the moment. Um, what, what I think is, more urgent for as a question, as I alluded to earlier on, is uh, if you go to one of these small banks and try to borrow against your intangible asset, your movie script, your your computer algorithm in development, that's much more difficult to do. So it's solving those kind of issues, which is, which is I think, what we need to confront. Sticking with the productivity theme, question from Vibab here. Why do you think productivity and growth have slowed down, even though firms are spending more than ever on R&D, which is a big factor for growth and innovation? Well, um, the uh, so Helen Simpson, who's on the call, is the big expert on R&D. So R&D has waxed and waned over the years. Um, it's kept rel relatively high in the UK uh, with the R&D tax credit, uh, for which people like Helen and, and others deserve a lot of credit uh, for having you know, um, promoted that idea. Um, on the other hand, public R&D um, has maybe not, uh, maybe there hasn't been as much spending as there might have been on that, which is to say R&D at universities, um, R&D at, uh, you know, technical centers and so forth. Um, and maybe we haven't quite got that system uh, right yet. Um, and the other thing is taking the R&D to market. It's not enough to invent these terrific ideas and write all these great papers uh, from a sort of commercialization point of view. Taking that to the market seems to be an enduring problem for us as well. Uh, we've just got two questions left at the moment, so maybe we'll link these together. Hmm. Uh, Luke is asking, is the UK's high budget deficit a concern? And then Laurie is asking, what is your view on the use of universal basic income in the economic recovery from COVID and beyond? Um, two, two good questions. Let me take Laurie's question um, first. Um, again, I haven't thought very hard about universal basic income, but the numbers I've seen um, is that it's just very, very expensive. Um, it depends slightly what you're going to do with universal basic income. And as I say, there are other people at Bristol. I think Sarah Smith is on the call. Um, she would know much more about this um, than me. So um, there are lots of people at Bristol um, who'll be able to t tell you much more about this. Um, but if you were to, I don't know, abolish all other benefits and go for universal basic income, um, it, it's very expensive to maintain that essentially um, because, and, and for obvious reasons, part of it is it's not very well targeted. So if you wanted it at a high level, but you were gonna pay it to everybody, um, you'd have to do a, um, a lot of taxation. Um, so that's on the universal basic income side. Um, what was the other question? Oh, the other question was about government debt. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> look, there's no pretending uh, that there's very large amounts of government debt uh, obviously being issued and to get out of this um, we have rightly uh, as a uh, um, as, as a society uh, fiscal policy has done all the left the heavy lifting so we've rightly borrowed a large amount of money uh, in order to try and smooth our way through this um, difficult uh, uh, this incredibly difficult period but it all is all going to have to be paid back um, so there are two things about that one thing is um, <laughs> Uh, being, on, being on the monetary policy, I am 
I, I have to sign a contract which says I'm not allowed to talk about fiscal policy. So um, if my um, uh, if my um, press officer is on the call, he's going to be busy trying to press the mute button as we speak. Um, so that's one thing I, sh I should say. So I have to be very careful. The second thing I should say, um, uh, <laughs> trying to get around all of that, hopefully my pre press officer has fallen off the call, um, is been in a way it comes back to the importance of productivity which is, of course, if the economy grows, then we can, without raising the proportional tax burden, start paying all this debt back from a growing economy. Uh, and the more the economy grows, the more good things that we can have as, as a society uh, and therefore put the, burden, the debt burden behind us. And indeed, that's how in many previous uh, eras, we've got out of these very high debt burdens, which have been uh, imposed on the country, you know, after wars and, and things like that. So in a sense, it takes you back to where we first started, which is Paul Krugman's point, that uh, productivity growth, you know, isn't everything, but in the long run, it is almost everything. Uh, and if we could get back to more productivity growth, uh, then, as I say, we can get out of this um, uh, this, this high debt burden uh, without making it even more burdensome on future generations. Yeah, absolutely. Start growing the pie again. Um, slightly controversial question here from Benjamin, who's asking, which central bank or government do you think has done the best job at lessening the long term economic impact of COVID? Oh, the Bank of England obviously has done by miles the best job. But um, <laughs> if I sorry, Ben, I, I, I should be treating your question um, a little more seriously. Uh, look, the truth is that different countries have had very different GDP experiences um, uh, in, in response to COVID, they've adopted different sets of policies. Broadly, uh, all countries, at least all developed countries, have been very accommodative. And we've had a combination of these various non-pharmaceutical interventions like lockdowns and so forth. It turns out to be pretty tricky to get a decent correlation between the extent of the GDP loss and the various indicators. And I think that's where Benjamin, your question is sort of going on that is, are there countries out there um, who've done stuff in a way which haven't given you much GDP loss? Um, hard to get those correlations. One thing which does look to be kind of important is when you locked down. And it does look like we in Britain locked down a little bit later than other countries did. Uh, and that seems to have had a longer term sort of spillover uh, into uh, in, into future difficulties. So look, there's, you know, this is, f you know, certainly not settled uh, yet. Um, let's try and negotiate our way out of all of this. Um, but it's a good question uh, as to understanding the kind of the fine differences uh, between the different countries. Yeah, and certainly good, good news on the Pfizer vaccine being approved today. <laughs> so maybe we can end on that positive note. Um, Absolutely. A lot of questions there, and I think we're just coming up to the hour. So I think we'll call it there. But thank you so much, Jonathan, for your time this evening. It's been thank you. very, very helpful bringing the production function and productivity to life for all of us. Um, cheers. Thank you very much, Ben. Thanks for all the questions uh, and very kind of